Hello everyone, welcome back to my stream. Tonight we're going to do some more lore reading, but before we start, might as well do some trading if... Let's see. Oh, we have... we still have time. Not much though. Right, first things first, let's read. One, two... Three... Four, five, six, seven. Damn it, seven. I thought it was like four. Oh well. Right, right let's start with trading then. What's wrong with you, buddy? Honored to see you again, my thane. Can we consider him a ghost? What do you need, my thane? The Jarl has recognized you as a person of great <laughs> importance in the hold. A hero. The title of thane is an honor, a gift for your service. Guards will know to look the other way if you tell them who you are. Mm -hmm. Alright, let us let our character sleep a bit. Like twelve hours. Yeah, sounds fun. Finally, our character gets some got who got some sleep, and our horse carl stopped glitching around. A second, please. All right, let's proceed. Everyone, oh, a bit of this and a bit of that. Perfect. Come back whenever you need something. We also got some money to trade with the street traders. I heard about you being pardoned. Beautiful things for beautiful people. Come back if you need a new ring or necklace. Any Take a look. When you need more meat, bring gold. Well, let's bring him some gold. But first, come on, in. our necessities first. Blood in has plenty of strong. Oh, it's you. Take a look. He exclaimed that, Oh, it's you, as if he met some ghost. Why do I keep going around with, the, with this knackerine?
I have no need for this mask. Remember, ale is cheap. You hope you're on the rent. We have to see you around. Well, since you're around, might as well read a book. What exactly are we going to read tonight? Women, history, and culture. Let's read something about the rising threat by Lathaniel of Sunhold. The following is the account of Lathaniel of Sunhold, an Altmer refugee from Somerset Isle who came to Cyrodiil in the early years of the fourth era. According to Lathaniel, he did not flee the aftermath of the oblivion crisis in Somerset, rather, he fled the darkening shadow of the Thalmor upon my beloved homeland. Nothing look at a very intense presence, to put it politely, and some of his accusations of Thalmor involvement border on madness. This may be why his fervent warnings and outspoken criticisms of the Thalmor in the Aldmeri Dominion went unheeded, but history has at least partially vindicated Lathaniel's claims. Praxis Radium, Imperial Historian. I was barely more than a child when the great anguish fell upon us. The very air was torn asunder, leaving gaping, infected wounds that spewed Daedra from the bowels of oblivion. Many flocked to the shores, seeking escape from Dagon's murderous host. The seas betrayed our people, raising up to smash our ships and our ports, leaving us to face so vile and wicked that death would seem a mercy. The Crystal Tower stood as our last bastion of hope in both the literal and figurative sense. Refugees filled the Crystal Tower until it could hold no more. I could taste the fear hanging in the air, feel the pall, pall of despair suffocating us. We could see the Daedra moving through the trees in the distance, but they did not come. Days passed and still the Daedra would not approach within arrow shot of the battlements. or began to grow. They fear us, some would say. Even a Daedra knows not to trifle with the wisdom and magics of the crystal-like law. It was as if the foul denizens of oblivion had been waiting for this very spirit to stoke our hearts before they acted. As we slept, innumerable legions of Daedra amassed around us, and they were not alone. Hundreds of Altmer prisoners were gathered with them. As dawn broke, we were awoken by their screams as the Daedra began to flail them and flay them. We watched in object horror as our kinfolk were defiled completely, carved up and eaten alive, impaled on their depraved war machines and wore it apart as meals for their profane beasts. This bloodletting was only a prelude to wet their, to wet their appetites. Once the Daedra finished with our, our kinfolk, they turned their eyes to the Crystal Tower. Our great and noble bastion proved as much of an impediment as a mighty oak to a landslide. Standing tall for but, for but a few moments, appearing almost able to ride the tide of destruction around it, but ultimately being swept away. Our exalted wizards decimated the fiends, roasting them by the dozens. Archers were fighting the narrowest of ch chinks in their daedric armor at over a hundred paces, felling their captains and commanders. The might and skillfulness of our heroic defenders was astonishing to behold, but it was not enough. The Daedra clambered over the corpses of their cohort. They marched headlong into death and destruction that would make the highest armies in all of Tamriel quake with fear. When they breached the walls, I fled along with the other cowards. I take no pride in that act. It has haunted my existence ever since, and I burn with shame to admit it, but it is truth. We fled in mindless panic, abandoning those stalwart Altmer who held the line against the onslaught to preserve and defend our illustrious crystal tower. We raced through cleverly concealed passageways and emerged well away from the chaos that had descended upon the tower. That is when it happened. It started like a ghost rustling through the leaves of a dense forest, but the sound did not taper off. It rose into a roar as the very ground on which I stood began to shudder. I turned to look and the world held its breath. 
I stood transfixed as the heart of my homeland was torn as if from my own breast. The unthinkable, the in incomprehensible, the Tower of Crystal-like law cast to the ground with all the dignity of a beggar meeting an ironclad fist. An eternity I watched, trying to reconcile what I knew with what I saw. You bro, welcome to my stream. Glad to see you here. Sobs wrecked my chest, and a weeping filled the air around me as the spell loosened its hold, and I realized where I was. There was scores of other refugees mesmerized by the horror that had likewise enscrolled me, and sorcelled me. Go, I crawled out as my heart, the, the heart of my land, shattered. No one moved, not even me. I mustered what will I could, and bellowed all the fear and hatred and agony at what had just happened, turning the world into a mindless shriek. Go! I ran then, feeling more than seeing that the others had followed. Rising Thread, Volume 2 by Lethaniel of Sunhold. Alright, this is... Um, hmm, this prologue is already was read in the previous book, so we'll just skip it. What happened after the Tower of Crystal-like Law fell was a daze. It was as if my mind simply stopped. Instinct took over as my every thought sank into a black abyss of despair. Time loss of meaning, and to this a day I know not how long I was in this state. Eventually a conscious thought managed to break my fugue. The dead record had vanished, gone as suddenly as they had come. Before my numbed mind could comprehend the tumult that consumed my beloved Summer's Isle, before I could formulate the question, how? They were he there, dripping, dripping honey, honeyed poison in our ears, the Thalmor. They were the ones that saved us, they claimed working deep and subtle magics. It was their efforts, their sacrifices that delivered the Altmer from extinction. Oh, what fools we were! We wanted so desperately someone to thank for ending our tribulations, we lavished it upon the first to step up and claim the glory. With that simple act of gratitude, we allowed a vile rot to seep into our homeland, to putrefy our once noble and distinguished civilization. It was months before I began to suspect the error we had made. Small twing twinges of unease would vex me, but each one alone was easy enough to disregard and push aside. The exile of the great seer mage, Rinandor, the bold, was the final doubt that I could not ignore. You see, Rinandor was one of the very few who survived the collapse of the Crystal Tower. I saw some of his bravery and heroics with my own eyes. It was his leadership and sorcery that made the Daedra pay such a high price for the destruction of the Crystal Tower. The Thalmor besmirched his name when he had the audacity to pub publicly doubt and question their role in ending the oblivion crisis in Somerset Isle. Rinandor made the mistake of ignoring the consensus gentium, trusting instead to logic and facts. The shrewdness of the Thalmor, however, was not such to allow something as trivial as the truth standing in their way. As soon as they shifted the collective opinion ever so slightly against Runendor, they had him sequestered and intensified their efforts to tarnish his reputation. Unable to mount any sort of defense to the Thalmor's attacks, Runendor was quickly denounced and exiled. Rising Thread, Volume 3 by Lethany of Sunhold. Again, the prologue we skip. Over so cautiously, I formed a cabal made up of others who distrusted the motives and methods of the Thalmor. Over several months, I liquidated my ancestral holdings to, and took whatever inheritance I could without raising any suspicions. I would follow after Rinandor and help him restore his reputation and status. We would then return to best the Thalmor at their own game and win back the Moors and morals of the Altmer. The rest of my cabal would stay in Somerset Isle and win the trust of the Thalmor on whatever level best suited each of them, sending clandestine missives to be to me when possible. After weeks of painstaking investigations and exorbitant, exorbitant bribes, I was able to learn that Rinandor was placed on a ship to Anvil. I booked my own passage to Anvil. My search almost ended there, for Rinandor had never arrived in Anvil Harbor. My instinct that Rinandor met a dupli duplicitous end was confirmed when I sought out, out as several of the deckhands who were reported to be aboard Rinandor's vessel. All died under mysterious and violent circumstances. 
The first of many attempts in my life occurred soon after. Needless to say, I survived, but my grand plan to st stymie me the Thalmor fell apart without any esteemed leader to rally behind. I went into hiding, waiting anxiously for a word of the Thalmor's activities back on Somerset Isle. Over the following years, I tried to bend the ear of the Empire through various avenues and warn them of the Thalmor's doings. The Empire, however, was having enough troubles dealing with the aftermath of the Oblivion Crisis within its own borders without seeking trouble in faraway Somerset. The assassination of Emperor Uriel Septim VII and his heirs, and the self-sacrifice of Martin Septim, the true savior of Somerset Isle and the rest of Tamriel. The Empire's leadership was left defunct. High Chancellor Okaro con convened the full Elder Council in an unsuccessful bid to select a new Emperor. Without an Emperor, the Empire beyond the reach of Cyrodiil began to splinter. Okato reluctantly agreed to become the potentate under the terms of the Elder Council, charter until imperial rule could be re-established, but a reluctant leader is a rarely strong leader. Potentate Okato made admirable efforts to rein in the bad lamb that threatened to rip the Empire apart, and was even making headway when Red Mountain erupted and destroyed much of Vardenfell. Likely, likely from Thalmor tampering, but I have yet to find proof of their misdeeds in this. What was left in Morrowind was thrown into absolute chaos. The effects of the eruption were felt even in Black Marsh, destroying roads and cutting off the Imperial garrisons there. None were prepared for what happened next. Rising Thread, Volume 4. Skipping the prologue. While Morrowind and the Imperial forces in Blackmarsh were still reeling from the consecutive catastrophes of the Oblivion Crisis and the destruction of Vardenfell, the Thalmor incited the Argonians to mount a massive uprising. Blackmarsh and Southern Morrowind were completely lost to the Argonians, but luckily the Thalmor too lost what influenced the head of the Reptilians. All the while, the Thalmor consolidated their hold over my beloved homeland. It took almost a decade before my own machinations put me into contact with Okaro. He seemed more interested than most in what I had to say about the Thalmor, maybe because he was himself an Altmer and recognized the threat they represented. It wasn't long before the Thalmor had Okato assassinated. Potentate Okato's murder began the Stormcrown Interregnum. The Elder Council fractured, leading into the years of ruthless infighting, plots and backstabbing. Many tried to claim the Ruby Throne. Most were pretenders to the crown, a few had legitimate claims, others still were a little more than brutal dullards who thought mere strength of arms was all the entitlement they needed. Violent, unnatural storms lashed the imperial city several times, during this anarchy always with the eye of the storm, looking directly down upon White Gold Tower as if this was the judgment of the Nine Divines. With the Empire submerged into, in this mayhem, the Thalmor were quick to act. They overthrew the rightful kings and queens of the Altmer. I remember the revulsion and horror that took hold when word reached me that this dementia had gripped my homeland. Once so proud and majestic, many of her great race actually embraced this insanity. Then the first of many pogroms descended on Somerset Isle. They slaughtered any who were not of the blood of the Altmer. Altmer. A fine excuse to purge the dissidents, as well the Thalmor have never been once to waste such an opportunity. After seven long bloody years, the Stormcrown Interregnum was ended when a Colovian warlord by the name of Titus Midi seized the crown. Whether he had rightful claim or not is moot. Without Titus Midi, there would be an empire today. There would not be an empire today. He proved a shrewd and capable leader such as such that Skyrim endorsed him as emperor. With the Empire stabilizing under the auspicious efforts of Emperor Titus Midi, I resumed my efforts to warn them of the Thalmor threat. Again, the Thalmor remained a step ahead. Before my efforts could come to fruition, the Thalmor struck, another coup, this time in Valenwood. The Empire was not prepared for the Thalmor's subterfuge and strategy. There are those who claim the combined Altmer and Bosmer forces greatly outmatched the Empire, but this, was, this is a farce. This short savage campaign was won by the Thalmor even before first blood was drawn. They waited and watched their enemy, they chose where and when they would attack. The Thalmor were able to bring the full fury of their small contingent of Altmer and Bosmer to any of several imperial 
strongholds. Contrary to the posturings of the Empire's generals, the Thalmor did not command greater numbers. They had better spies and greater mobility, and knew how best to use them. This is the menace that the Thalmor represent. They are cruel and merciless, but they are no fools. They are devious and subtle, and so very patient. In one fell stroke, the Thalmor took a strategic foothold on the mainland of Tamriel and prevented any significant attempt the Empire could have made to invade Somerset Isle and depose the tyranny of the Thalmor. At the same time, they took a better vantage to continue to watch the Empire and wait. In so doing, they also revived the Aldmer Dominion with their alliance to the Bosmer of Velenwood. Of the decades, the Thalmor have grown quiet. This is not the end. It has only just begun. They merely consolidate their power and tighten their grip on the hearts and minds of the Altmer. The Empire may wish to forget the wounds its pride has suffered at the hands of the Thalmor, but they are still out there, plotting, watching, waiting. While the Empire is content to secure its inconsequential corners of its vast holdings, the threat of the Thalmor continues to rise. Not since Potentate Okado has anyone in the Empire listened to me, I beseech any and all the citizens of this renowned empire to heed my words. The Thalmor must be stopped before it is too late. Soon after Lethen of Sunhul commissioned to have these volumes printed and distributed far and wide in the empire with his own coin, he himself met a violent end. In light of the events that followed his death, we must consider that he may very well have been murdered by Thalmor assassins. Praxis Aratium, Imperial Historian. Must unload the mask. Blade of the Reach. Well, this Rising Threat book a series was actually short. So now I have hope. That we are closer to the end than I initially thought. Okay, you're off to sleep, been awake for 20 hours. Alright, have a good night, bro. Sleep tight. And I hope to see you around. Good night, bro. May your weapons be sharp. Take a look. Cured. So, you're interested in my potions and ingredients? Ingredients? Sure. I 
send them over. Okay. Now you let me know if you need a cure. Need something? <laughs> She's so hostile when she exits her building. Right. All right. All the only this shop left. I mean, these two shops. I'm Calcelmo's Good to take a look. Around the laboratory. Where's the blacksmith? Oh, there you are. May your neck, blades, helmets, pretty much anything to suit your needs. Okay, now we're going to the second series of books to read. Probably we should pick some huge series. That might be a mistake, but still. Dedric Warhammer of the Vampire. The Song of Pelennal, Volume 1, and his name. Editor's note, Volumes 1 through 6 are taken from the so-called Raymond manuscript located in the Imperial Library. It is a transcription of older fragments collected by an unknown scholar of the early Second Era. Beyond this, little is known of the original sources of these fragments, some of which appear to be from the same period, perhaps even from the same manuscript. But as no scholarly consensus yet exists on dating these six fragments, no opinions will be offered here. But he took the that he took the name Pelennal was passing strange, no matter his later sobriquet, which were many. That was an elvish name, and Pelennal was a scourge on that race, and not much given to irony. Pelennal was much too grim for that. Even in youth, he wore white hair, and trouble followed him. Perhaps his enemy named Pelennal of their own in their tongue 
but that is doubtful, for it means glorious night, and he was neither to them. Certainly many others added to that name during his days in Tamriel. He was pulling all the white streak because of his left hand made of a killing light. He was pulling all the bloody, for he drank it in victory. He was pulling all the surgeon because he gave the crusades a face. He was pulling all in triumph, as the words eventually became synonymous and men at arms gave thanks to the eight when they saw his banner coming through war. He was pulling all the blamer, for he was quick to admonish those allies of his that favored tactics that ran counter to his, that is, sword theory, and he was pulling all the third, though whether he, this was because some said he was a god geezer, or a god geyser, who had incarnated twice before already, or that simpler, he was the third version given to Perif, and on Alessia, in her prayers of liberation before he walked among the quarters of the rebellion is unknown. The start is good. The Song of Pelinol, Volume 2, and his coming. And then Perif spoke to the handmaiden again, eyes to the heavens which had not known kindness since the beginning of Elven Rue, and she spoke as a mortal whose kindle is beloved by the gods of its strength and weakness, a humility that can burn with metaphor and yet break easily and always, always doomed to end in death, and this is why those who let their souls burn anyway are beloved of the dragon his king. And she said, and this thing I have thought of, I have named it, and I call it freedom, which I think is just another word for Cesar who goes missing, you, made the first reign at his sundering, and that is what I ask now for our alien masters, that we might sunder them fully and repay their cruelty by dispersing them to, draw, to drown in the topal. Murray House, your son, mighty and snorting, gore-horned, winged, when next he flies down, let him bring us anger. And then, kind granted pair of another symbol, a diamond soaked red with the blood of elves, whose faces could and sector and form into a man whose every angle could cut he, her jailers and a name Pelin L, which is the star made knight, and he was arrayed in armor from the future time. And he walked into the jungles of Sirius always already killing, Mori House stamping at his side froth bloody and bellowing from excitement because the Pelinel was come. And Pelinel came to Perif's camp of rebels holding a sword and mace both encrusted with the smashed viscera of elven faces, feathers and magic beads, which were the markings of the Eiladun. Stuck to the redness that hung from his weapons, and he lifted them, saying, These were their eastern chieftains, no longer full of their talking. Song of Pelinal, Volume 3, On His Enemy Pelinal Weistrake was the enemy of all elf kind that lived in Sirot in, these, in those days, mainly though he took it upon himself for, to slay the sorcerer kings of the Elids in pre-arranged open combats rather than at war. The fields of rebellion he left to the growing armies of the Perivania and his bull nephew. Pelinol called out Heromir of Copper and T into a duel at the tour, and ate his neck veins while screaming praise to Remen, a name that no one knew yet. Gordar, the shaper's head, was smashed upon the goat faced altar of Ninendava, and in his wisdom, Pelinel said a small plague spell to keep that evil from reforming by Wilkin magic. Later that season, Pelinel slew Hadul on the granite steps of Seatar, the Fire King's spears, knowing their first re refute. For a time, no weapon of the Aelids could pierce his armor which Pelinel admitted was unlike any crafted by men, but would say no more even when pressed. When Huna, whom Pelinel raised from grain slave to hoplite and loved well, took death from an arrowhead made from the beak of Selethelel, the singer, the white track went on his first madness. He wrought destruction from Narlemay all the way to Celadio and erased those lands from the maps of elves and men, and all things in them, and Perif was forced to make sacrifice to the gods to keep them from leaving the earth in their disgust. And then 
came the stormy white gold, where the Aelis had made a pact with the Aurorans of Meridia and summoned them and appointed the terrible and golden-hued half-elf, Umaril the Unfeathered as their champion, and for the first time since his coming it was Pelinal who was called out to battle by another, for Umaril had the blood of the other and would never know death. The Song of Pelinal, Volume 4, on his deeds. Pelinal drove the sorcerer armies past the Nibbon, claiming all the eastern lands for the rebellion of the Paravania, and Cain had to send her rain to wash the blood from the villages and forts that no longer flew Elis' banners, for the armies of men needed to make camps of them as they went forward, and he broke the doors open for the prisoners of Vatace, with the slave queen flying in a Mori house above them, and men called her Alesh for the first time. He entered the gate at to win back the hands of the thousand strong of Sedor, a tribe now unknown but famous in those days, which the Elites had stolen in the night, two thousand hands, and he brought back in a wagon made of demon, demon bone, whose wheels trailed the sound of women when ill at heart. Text lost. And after the first pogrom, which consolidated the northern holdings for the men of Creeth, he stood with white hair gone brown with elf blood at the bridge of Heldon, where Perov's falconers had sent for the Norse, and they, looking at him, said that Shur had returned, but he spat at their feet for profaning that name. He led them anyway into the heart of the hinterland west to drive the aliens inward towards the tower of white gold, a slow retreating circle that could not understand the power of man's sudden liberty and what fury idea that brought. His mace crushed the thunder necks that Umaril sent as harriers on the rebellion's long march back south and east, and carried Mori House breath of kind to Zuathas and clever cutting man, and need a needy with a kept to name for healing when the ball had fallen to a volley of bird beaks, and of course, at the Council of Skiffs, where all of the Perivania's armies and all of the Norse shook with fear at the storming white gold, so much so that Alesh herself counseled delay, Pelinal grew furious and made names of Umaril and made names of what colors he thought he saw around him, and then made for the tower by himself, where Pelinal often acted without thought. The Song of Pelinal, Volume 5, on his love of Mori House. It is a solid truth that Mori House was the son of Cain, but whether or not Pelinal was indeed the Cesarine is best left unsaid, for once Plantinu, who favored the short sword, said it, and that night he was smothered by moths. It is famous, though, that the two talked of each other as family with Mori House as the lesser, and that Pelinal loved him and called his him nephew, but these could be merely the f fancies of immortals. Never did Pelinal counsel Mori House in times of, of war, for the man bull fought magnificently and led men well and never resorted to madness, but the white strike did warn against the growing love with Perif. We are other more and change things through love. We must take care lest we beget more monsters on this earth. If you do not desist, she will take to you, and you will transform all spirit if you do this. And to this the bull became shy, for he was a bull, and he felt his form too ugly for the par Parvania at all times, especially when she disrobed for him. He snorted though, and shook his nose hoop into the light of the Secunda moon and said, she is like this shine on my nose hoop here, an accident sometimes, but whenever I move my head at night, she is there, and so you know what you ask is impossible. The Song of Pelinal, Volume 6 on his madness. And it is said that he emerged into the world like a pedomaic, that is, born by Sithis and all the forces of change therein. Still others, like Fid of the of New Teed, say beneath the Pelinal's star armor was a chest that gave open to show no heart, only a red rage shaped diamond fashion, singing like a mindless dragon, and that 
This was proof that he was a myth echo and that where he trod were shapes of the first origin. Penel cared for none of this and killed any who could speak god logic except for a fair pair of who he said enacts rather than talks as language without exertion is dead witness. When those soldiers who heard him say this stared blank blankly, he left and swung his sword, running to the reign of kind to slaughter their alien captives, screaming, O oh, Akka, for our shared madness I do this. I watch you watching me watching back. Umaril dares call us out, for that is how we made him. And it was during these fits of anger and nonsense that Pelinol would fall into the madness, where whole swaths of lands were devoured in divine rampage to become void, and Alessia would have to pray to the gods for their succor, and they would reach down as one mind and soothe the wise track until he no longer had the will to kill the earth in whole, and Garrett of the men of G once saw such madness from afar and maneuvered after it had abated to drink together with Pelinal, and he asked what such an affliction felt like, to which Pelinal could only answer like when the dream no longer needs its dreamer. The Song of Pelinal, Volume 7, on his battle with Umaril and his dismemberment. And so, after many battles with Umaril's allies, uh, where dead Aurora lay like candlelight around the throne, the Pelinal became surrounded by the last alien sorcerer kings and their demons, each one heavy with ver lines. Westrek cracked the floor with his mace and they withdrew, and he said, Bring me Umaril that called me out. And while mighty in his aspect and wicked deathless golden Umaril favored ruin from afar over close combat, and so he tarried in the shadows of the White Tower before coming forth. More soldiers were sent against Pelinhal to die, and yet they managed to pierce his armor with axes and arrows, for Umaril had wrought each one by long ver lines, which he had been hoarding since his first issue of challenge. Presently, the half elf showed himself, bathed in meridian light, and he listed the, his bloodline in the Eiladun and spoke of his father, a god of the previous Kalpa's world river, and taking great delight in the heavy breathing of Pelinol, who had finally bled, tax lost, and Umaril was laid low. The angel face of his helm dented into an ugliness which made Pelinol laugh, and his unfeathered wings broke off with sword strokes delivered by Pelinol stood frothing. Above him, insulting his ancestry and anyone else that took ship from old Elnofe, which angered the other elvish kings and drove them to a madness of their own, and they fell on him speaking to their weapons, cutting the Pelinol into aids while he roared in confusion, which even the Council of Skiffs could hear. Text lost. Renwen Moore shook the whole of the tower with mighty bashing from his horns the next morning, and some were slain in overabundance in the taking, and men looked for more aliens to kill, but Pelinal had left none save those kings and demons they had already begun to flee. It was Mori House who found the wise Drake's head, which the kings had left to prove their deeds, and they spoke, and Pelinal said things of regret, but the rebellion had turned anyway, and more words were said between these immortals that even the paravent would not deign to hear. Song of Pelinal on his revelation at the death of the Alesh. And uh, left you to gather sinew with my other half, who will bring light thereby to that mortal idea that brings the gods great joy, that is freedom, which even the heavens do not truly know, which is why our father, the text lost, in those first days spirit swirls before convention, that which we echoed in our earthly madness, let us now take you up, we will show our true faces, which eat one another in amnesia each age. Well, that was, was a long cycle of books, but at least we did this in 20 minutes.
We even ate one clam. Oh, our character gotta eat something, right? I think it was Ruby Claw. Yeah. Whoa, we unloaded quite substantially, I might say. We should have read more in the game. That way we would be less encumbered anyways. So, our plan is thus. We will visit the Blades. And they at their sky heaven temple listen to their opinions and leave them be then we're gonna read some more let's do it Kajiti traders are here. I'm going the wrong way, damn it. Where am I? Yeah, this is the right way now. At least I hope so. On the map it looks like the right way. What's that? It's an ore. Where the hell am I? Oh, of course.
So, what do you have for me? Any congratulations? That's really not the uh, Aldo. Delphine has been very worried about you. Please. Delphine has We heard the news from Whiterun worried. that you left the city on the back of a dragon. That's a little showy, even for you. Since you're still alive, I assume you have good news to report. Yes, I use Alduin's portal to travel to Sovngarde. He's dead. Gods above, that's better news than I had hoped. When you walked into my inn that day, I never imagined where it would all lead. Dragons out of legend. Sovngarde. Well, about Parthor next. Make your choice, Dragonborn. You're either with us or against us. But he us. left! Why does he need to die? He already he left Skyrim. Him. He helped Alduin enslave our ancestors. He may have betrayed Alduin in the end, but that makes him worse, not better. We can't afford to give Parthenax the opportunity to betray us in turn and return to his old master. Old master, who's dead. See this day. Thank you. Thank you, Dragonborn. You've done a great service for us all. Well, please, this There's guy. There's still the matter of Parthenax. I'm not ungrateful for what you've done. Esbern speaks for both. Oh, really? But our oath as blades binds us. Parthenax must die. There's no excuse now that Alduin is dead. I'm afraid she's right. Deeply sorry that this has to come between us. But just as Parthenax's later deeds do not expiate his crime, your deeds do not allow us to ignore our duty. I hope you will return to us soon. The news that justice has finally been done, with both Alduin and Parthenax dead, a dark chapter in history will finally be closed. Are you serious? Yes. What is it? That's all. Do the right thing. Parthenax deserves to die. Maybe it's you who deserves to die. All the way from the start they were of little use. Uh, in fact, they even have stolen the Jurgen Windcaller's horn just to bring my attention to them wasting my time. I'm a blade now. I can hardly believe it. I'm a blade now. I can hardly believe it. The yeah, blade. it's hard to believe a common cell sword will become a blade. Let's go back to Mark Earth and do some reading. Still got six series of books to read. At least we didn't have to kill anyone on our way there. This is the encounter spot. Alright, no hostiles. Nothing to say to me. You're that mage from the college, right? Here things are finally calmed down. Oh, nice. 
of course things calm down there because this place is now run by Im I the Empire. Telling you, I heard it. How? Those werewolf tales are true. Right. Let's proceed with the reading. What should I read next? Cleansing the Fane? Probably not. Dwemer History and Culture. Chapter 1 Mara Barsul and the Trivialization of the Dwemer in Popular Culture by Hesfed and Tabalis. While Mara Barsul's ancient tales of the Dwemer was definitely debunked in scholarly circles as early as the reign of Kataria I, it remains one of the staples of the literate middle classes of the Empire, and has served to set the image of the Dwemer in the popular imagination for generations of schoolchildren. But while this lengthy but curiously and insubstantial tome has proved so captivating to the public that he's been able to see off both the scorn of the literati and the scathing critics of the scholars, before examining, examining this question, a brief summary of the provenance and subsequent career of ancient tales would be appropriate. First published around 2nd year 670, in the interaction between the fall of the First Cyrodiilic Empire and the rise of Tiber Septim, it was originally presented as a serious scholarly work based on the research in the archives of the University in Guilim, and in the chaos of that era was taken at face value to sign a of the sad state of Dwemer scholarship in those years, little is known of the author, but Mara Barsul was most likely a pseudonym of Gorfelim, a prolific writer of penny dreadful romances of that era, who is known to have used many other pseudonyms. While most of Felim's all other works has thankfully been lost to history, but little survives matches ancient tales in both language and tone. See Lomi's textual comparison of Gore Felim, Felim's a hypothetical treachery with Marowar Sul's ancient tales of the Dwemer. Felim lived in Cyrodiil his whole life, writing light entertainments for the elite of the old imperial capital. Why he decided to turn his hands, hand to the Dwemer is unknown, but it is clear that his research consisted of nothing more than collecting the peasant's tales of the Nibine Valley and recasting them in Dwemer guise. The book proved popular in Cyrodiil, and Felim continued to churn out more volumes until the series numbered seven in all. Ancient Tales of the Dwemer was thus firmly established as a local favorite in Cyrodiil, already in its 17th printing, when the historical forces that propelled Tiber Septim to prominence also began to spread the literate of the heartland across the continent. Marubar Sul's version of the Dwemer was seized upon in the search of human racial nationalism that has not yet subsided. The Dwemer appear in these tales as creatures of fable and light fantasy, but in general they are just like us. They come across a bit eccentric perhaps, but certainly there is nothing fearsome or dangerous about them. Compare these to the Dwemer of early Redguard legend, a mysterious powerful race capable of bending the very laws of nature to their will. Vanished but perhaps not gone, or the Dwemer portrayed in the most ancient Norse sa sagas, fearsome warriors tainted by blasphemous religious practices who used their profane mechanisms to drive the Norse from Morrowind. Marobar Sul's Dwemer were much more amenable to the spirit of the time, which saw humans as the pinnacle of creation and the other races as unenlightened barbarians of, or imperfect lesser versions of human, humans eager for tutelage. Ancient Tales falls firmly in the latter camp, which does much to explain its enduring hold on the popular imagination. 
our Barso Dwemer are so much more comfortable, so much friendlier, so much more familiar than the real Dwemer, whose truly mysterious nature we are only beginning to understand. The public prefers the light, trivial version of this vanished race, and from what I have learned in my years of studying the Dwemer, I have some sympathy for that preference, as the following essays will show the Dwemers were, to our modern eyes, a remarkably unlikable people in many ways. Twenty nine twenty Morning Star Volume One The Last Year of the First Era by Carlo Wagtonway First Morning Star twenty nine twenty Mornhold Morrowind Am Alexia lay in her bed for fur dreamy, not until the sun burned through her window infusing the light wood and flesh colours of her chamber in a milky glow did she open her eyes. It was quiet and serene, a stunning reverse of the flavour of her dreams, so full of blood and celebration. For a few moments she simply stared at the ceiling, trying to sort through her visions. In the courtyard of her palace was a boiling pool which steamed in the coolness of the winter morning. At the wave of her hand it cleared and she saw the face and form of her lover Vivek in his study to the north. She did not want to speak right away. He looked so handsome in his dark red robes, writing his poetry as he did every morning. Vivek, she said, and he raised his head in a smile, looking at her face across thousands of miles. I have seen a vision of the end of the war. After eighty years, I don't think anyone can imagine an end. That Vivek with a smile, but he grew serious, trusting Almalexia's prophecies. Who will win, Morrowind or the Cyrodiilic Empire? Without Sothasil in Morrowind, we will lose, she replied. My intelligence tells me the Empire will strike us to the north in early springtide, by first seed at the latest. Could you go to our team and convince him to return? I leave today, she said simply. Fourth Morning Star 2920, Gideon, Black Marsh. The Empress paced around her cell. Wintertide gave her wasteful energy, while in the summer she would merely sit by her window and he grateful for each breath of stale swamp wind that came to cool her. Across the room, her unfinished tapestry of a dance at the imperial court seemed to mock her. She ripped it from its frame, tearing the pieces apart as they drifted to the floor. Then she left with her own useless gesture of defiance. She would have plenty of time to repair it and craft a hundred more. The Emperor had locked her up in Castle Giovese seven years ago and would likely keep her here until he or she died. With a sigh, she pulled the cord to, her, to call her knight, Zook. He appeared at the door within minutes, fully uniformed as befitted an imperial guard. Most of the natives, Kothringi, tribesmen of the Black, Black Marsh, preferred to go about naked, but Zug had taken a positive delight to fashion. His silver but reflective skin was scarcely visible on, only on his face, neck and hands. Your Imperial Highness, he said with a bow. Zug said to Empress Tavia, I'm bored. Let's discuss methods of assassinating my husband today. 14th morning starts 2920, the Imperial City, Cyrodiil. The chimes, of proclaim, the chimes proclaiming South Wind's prayer echoed through the wide boulevards and gardens of the Imperial City, calling all, all to their temples. The Emperor Riven III always attended the service at the Temple of the One, while his son and heir, Prince Juileg, found it more political to attend the service at a different temple for each religious holiday. This year it was at the Cathedral Benevolence of Mara. The Benevolence's services were mercifully short, but it was not until well after noon that the Emperor was able to return to the palace. By then the arena combatants were impatiently waiting for the start of the ceremony. The crowd was far less restless, as the potentate Versi Duce had arranged for a demonstration from a troop of Khajiit acrobats. Your religion is so much more convenient than mine, said the Emperor to his potentate by way of an apology. What is the first game? A one-on-one -on -one battle between two able warriors, said the potentate, his scaly skin catching the sun as he rose, armed befitting their culture. Sounds good, said the Emperor and clapped his hands at the sport commands. As soon as he saw the two warriors enter the arena, 
to the roar of the crowd, Emperor Rima III remembered that he had agreed to this several months before and forgotten about it. One combatant was the potentate's son, Severian Chorak, a glistening ivory yellow eel gripping his katana and wakizashi with his thin, deceptively weak looking arms. The other was the Emperor's son, Prince Juelek, in ebony armor with a savage orcish helm, shield and longsword at his side. This will be fascinating to watch his, his, the potentate, a white grin across his narrow face. I don't know if, if I've ever seen, even seen a serial fight on Akavir like this. I, if see, I don't know if I've even seen a serial fight on Akavir like this. Usually it's army against army. At last we can settle which philosophy is better, to create armor to combat swords as your people do, or to create swords to combat armor as mine do. No one in the crowd aside from a few scattered Akaviri counselors and the potentate himself wanted Saviri and Chorak to win, but there was a collective intake of breath at the sight of his graceful movements. His sword seemed to be a part of him, a tail coming from his arms to match the one behind him. It was a trick of counterbalance allowing the young serpent man to roll up into a circle and spin to the center of the ring in offensive position. The prince had to plod forward the less impressive traditional way. As they sprang at each other, the crowd bellowed with delight. The Akaviri was like a moon in orbit around the prince, effortlessly springing over his shoulder to attempt to blow from behind, but the prince whirled around quickly to block with his shield. His counter-strike went on the air as his foe fell flat to the ground and slithered between his legs, tripping him. The prince fell to the ground with a resounding crash. Metal and air melted together as severe and chorak rained strike after strike upon the prince, who blocked every one with his shield. We don't have shields in our culture, murmured Vershidi say to the emperor. It seems strange to my boy, I imagine. In our country, if you don't want to get bit, to, to get hit, you move out of the way. As Severe and Chorak was rearing back to begin another series of blinding attacks, the prince kicked at his tail, sending him falling back momentarily. In an instant he had rebounded, but the prince was also back on his feet. The two circled one another until the snake man spun forward, katana extended. The prince saw his false plan and blocked the katana with his longsword and the wagisashi with his shield. Its short punching blade impaled itself in the metal and Severe and Chorak was thrown off balance. The prince's long blade slashed across the Akavir's chest and the sudden intense pain caused him to drop both his weapons. In a, in a, moment, it was, in a moment it was over. Severe and Chorak was prostrate in the dust with the prince's long sword at his throat. The game's over, shouted the emperor, barely heard over the applause from the stadium. The prince grinned and helped Saviran Chorak up and over to a healer. The emperor clapped his potentate on the back, feeling relieved. He had not realized when the fight had begun how little chance he had given his son at victory. He will make a fine warrior, said Versaduche and the great emperor. Just remember, left the emperor, you and Kavir have a lot of showy moves, but if just one of our strikes comes through, it's all over for you. Or oh, I'll remember that, nodded the potentate. Raymond thought about that comment for the rest of the games and had trouble fully enjoying himself. Could the potentate be another enemy, just as the Empress had turned out to be? The matter would bear watching. 21st Morning Star, 2920, Mournhold, Morrowind. Why don't you wear that green gown I gave you? asked the Duke of Mournhold, watching the young maiden put on her clothes. It doesn't fit, smiled Turala, and you know I like red. It doesn't fit because you're getting fat, left the duke, pulling her down on the bed, kissing her breasts and the pouch of her stomach. She left it in the tickles but pulled herself up, wrapping her red robe around her. I'm round like a woman should be, said Turala. Will I see you tomorrow? No, said the duke, I must ent entertain Vivek tomorrow, and the next day the duke of Ebonhard is coming. Do you know, I never really appreciated Almalexia and her political skills until she left. It is the same with me, smiled Turala. You will only appreciate me when I'm gone. That's not true at all, snorted the Duke. I appreciate you now. Turala allowed the Duke one last kiss before she was out the door. She kept thinking about what he said. Would he appreciate her more or less when he knew that she was getting fed because she was carrying his child? 
Would he appreciate her enough to marry her? The year continues in sun's dawn. Hmm. Now that is a long cycle. Red. 2920 sun's dawn, book 2. The last year of the first year, by Kerlovac Townway. Third sun's dawn, 2920. The Isle of Artem, Somerset. So Thassil watched the initiates float one by one up to the OS zone tree, taking a fruit or a flower from its high branches before dropping back to the ground with varying degrees of grace. He took a moment while nodding his head in approval to admire the day. The whitewashed statue of Surveyne, which the great mage was said to have posed for in ancient days, stood at the precipice of the cliff overlooking the bay. Pale purple proscaro flowers waved to and fro in the gentle breeze, beyond ocean and the misty border between Artem and the main island of Somerset. By and large acceptable, he pro proclaimed as the last student dropped her fruit in his hand. The wave of his hand, the fruit and flowers were back in the tree. With another wave, the student had formed a position in a semicircle around the sorcerer. He pulled a small fibrous ball, about a foot in diameter, from his white robes. What is this? The students understood this test. It tasked them to cast a spell of identification on a mysterious object. Each initiate closed his or her eyes and imagined the ball in the realm of the universal truth. Its energy had a unique resonance as all physical and spiritual matters does, matter does, a negative aspect, a duplicate version, relative paths, true meaning, a song in the cosmos, a texture in the fabric of space, a facet of being that has always existed and always will exist. A ball, said a young Nord named Wellog, which brought giggles from some of the younger initiates, but a frown from most including so the seal. If you must be stupid, at least be amusing, growled the sorcerer, and then looked at a young dark-haired Altmer lass who looked confused. Lilatha, do you know? It's a Grom, said Lilatha uncertainly. What the Drum have after the Krevenism. Krevenism. Krevenism, but very good nonetheless, said Sothasil. Now tell me, what does that mean? I don't know, admitted Lilatha. The rest of the students also shook their heads. There are layers to understanding all things, said Sothasil. The common man looks at an object and fits it into a place in his way of thinking. Those skilled in the old ways, in the way of the psychic, in mysticism, can see an object and identify it by its proper role. But one more layer is needed to be peeled back to achieve understanding. You must identify the object by its role and its truth and interpret the me that meaning. In this case, this ball is indeed Grom, which is a substance created by the Drow, an underwater race in the north and western parts of the continent. For one year of their life, they undergo Carvinasium when they walk upon the land. Following that, they return to the water and meth, or devour the skin and organs they needed for land dwelling. Then they vomit it up into a little bolt like this, Grom, Drow vomit. The student looked at the ball a little queasily, so Thassil always loved this lesson. Fourth Sun's Dawn, 2920, the Imperial City, Cyrodiil. Spies, muttered the Emperor, sitting in his bath, staring at a lump on his foot. All around me, traitors and spies. His mistress, Rija, washed his back, her legs wrapped around his waist. She knew after all these many years when to be sensual and when to be sexual. When he was in a mood like this, it was best to be calmly, soothingly, seductively sensual, and not to say a word unless he asked her a direct question, which he did. What do you think when a fellow steps on his Imperial Majesty's foot and says I'm sorry, Your Imperial Majesty? Don't you think pardon me, Your Imperial Majesty is more appropriate? I'm sorry? Well, that almost sounds like the bastard Argonian was sorry I, I'm his Imperial Majesty, and he hopes we lose the war with Morrowind, that's what it sounds like. What would make you feel better? asked Rija. Would you like him flogged? He is only, as you say, the battle chief of Saulrest. It would teach him to mind where he's stepping. My father would have flogged him. My grandfather would have had him would have had him killed. The Emperor grumbled. But I don't mind if they all step on my feet provided they respect me and don't plot against me. 
You must trust someone. Only you, smiled the Emperor, turning slightly to give Risha a kiss, and my son, son Julek, I suppose, though I wish he were a little more cautious. And your counsel, and the potentate, asked Risha, a pack of spies and a snake, laughed the uh, Emperor, kissing his mistress again. As they began to make love, he whispered, as long as you are true, I can handle the world. Thirteen suns dawn. 2920, Morrenhold, Morrowind. Turala stood at the black, bejeweled city gates. A wind howled around her, but she felt nothing. The duke had been furious upon hearing his favorite mistress was pregnant and cast her from his sight. He tried again and again to see him, but his guard turned her away. Finally, she returned to her family and told them the truth. It's one, if only she had lied and told them she did not know who the father was. A soldier, a wandering adventurer, anyone. But she told them that the father was the Duke, a member of the House Indoril, and they did what they, she knew they would have to do as proud member, members of the House Redoran. Upon her hand was burned the sign of expulsion her weeping father had branded on her, but the Duke's cruelty hurt her far more. She locked out the gate and into the wide winter plains, twisted sleeping trees and skies without birds. The one in Morrowind would take her in now. She must go far away. With slow sad steps she began her journey. Sixteenth Sun's Dawn, 2920. Sanchal, Anikina, modern day, elsewhere. What troubles you? asked Queen Hassam, noticing her husband's soul sour mood. At the end of most lovers' days, he was in an excellent mood, dancing in the ballroom with all the guests, but tonight he retired early. When she found him, he was curled in the bed, frowning. That blasted bar's tale about Polydor and Eloisa, but put me in a rotten state, he growled. Why did he have to be so depressing? But isn't that the truth of the tale, my dear? Weren't they doomed because of the cruel nature of the world? It doesn't matter what the truth is. He did a rotten job of telling a rotten tale, and I'm not going to let him do it anymore. King Drosé sprang from the bed. His eyes were roomy with tears. Where did they say he was from again? I believe Gil Gilverdale or in easternmost Wellenwood, said the Queen, shaken. My husband, what are you going to do? Drosel was out of the, of the room in a single spring, bounding up the stairs to his tower. If Queen Hasama knew what her husband was going to do, she did not try to stop him. He had been erratic of late prone to fits and even occasional seizures, but she never suspected the depths of his madness and his loathing for the bars in his tale of the wickedness and perversity found in mortal man. 19th Sun's Dawn, 2920, Gilverdale, Valenwood. Listen to me again, said the old carpenter. If sell three holes worthless brass, then sell two holes the gold key. If sell one holds the gold key, the cell three hold worthless brass. If cell two holds worthless brass, then cell one holds the gold key. I understand, said the lady, you told me, and so cell one holds the gold key, right? No, said the carpenter. Let me start from the top. Mama, said the little boy, pulling uh, his mother's sleeve. Just one moment, dear, mother's talking, she said, concentrating on the riddle. You said cell three holds the golden key, if cell two holds worthless brass, right? No, said the carpenter. Cell three holds worthless brass, if cell two. Mama, cried the boy, his mother finally looked. A bright red mist was pouring over the town in a wave, engulfing building after building in its wake. Striding before was a red-skinned giant, the Daedra Moloch Pal. He was smiling. 29th Sunstone, 2920, Gilverdale, Valenwood. Malexia stopped her steed in the vast moor of mud to let him drink from the river. He refused to even seem repelled by the water. It struck her as odd. They had been making excellent time from Morrenhold, and surely he must be thirsty. She dismounted and joined her retinue. Where are we now? she asked. One of her ladies pulled out a map. I thought we were approaching a town called Gilverdale. Almalexia closed her eyes and opened them again quickly. The vision was too much to bear. As her followers watched, she picked up a piece of brick and a fragment of bone and clutched them to her heart. We must continue on to Artaeum, she said quietly. The year continues in the first sea.
Right, we need just quick pause and I'll be back. Please wait for a bit. All right, let's continue onwards. Twenty-nine, twenty, first seed, volume three. Last year of the first year by Carlo Vattanway. Fifteenth, first seed, twenty-nine, twenty, Caer Suvio, Cyrodiil. From their vantage point high in the hills, the Emperor Raymond the Third would could still see the spires of the Imperial City, but he knew he was far away from Carlton home. Lord Glavius had a luxurious villa, but it was not close to being large enough to house the entire army within its walls. Tents lined the hillsides, and the soldiers were flocking to enjoy his lordship's famous hot springs. Little wonder, winter chill still hung in the air. Prince Julek, your son is not feeling well. When Potentate's verse duché spoke, the emperor jumped. How that Ekiver could slither across the grass without making a sound was a mystery to him. Poisoned that wager, grumbling Raymond. See to it, he gets a healer. I told him to hire a taster, like I have, but the boy's head's strong. There are spies all around us, I know it. I believe you're right, Your Imperial Majesty, said Versiduche. There are treacherous times, and we must take precautions to see that Morrowind does not win this war, either on the field or by more insidious means. That's why I would suggest that you not lead the vanguard into battle. I know you would want to, as your illustrious ancestors Raymond I, Brazilus Dor, and Raymond II did, but I fear it would be foolhardy. I hope you do not mind me speaking frankly like this. No, not Raymond. I think you're right. Who would lead the vanguard then? I would say Prince Julek, if he were feeling better, replied the Akivir. Failing that, Storic of Faron, with Queen Nakea of Riverhold at left flank, and war chief Ulag of Lilgmoth at right flank. A Khajiit at left flank and an Argonia at right front the Emperor. I never do trust beast folk. 
The potentate took no offense. He knew that these folk referred to the natives of Temriel, not to the Tsaeskio or Vakivir like himself. I quite agree, your imperial majesty, but you must agree that they hate the Dunmer. Ulag has a particular grudge after all the slave raids on his lands by the Duke of Mournhold. The emperor conceded it was so, and the potentate retired. It was sub surprising, thought Riemann. But for the first time, the potentate seemed trustworthy. He was a good man to have it on one side. 18th first seat, 2920, Ald Erfold, Morrowind. How far is the Imperial Army? asked Vivek. Two days march, replied his lieutenant. If we march all night tonight, we can get higher ground at the Pri Priai tomorrow morning. Our intelligence tells us uh, the Emperor will be commanding the rear historic of Farun has the vanguard, Nagaya of Riverhald at left flank and Ulakth of Lilmoth at right flank. Ulakth, whispered Vivek, an idea for me. Is this intelligence reliable? Who brought it to us? A Breton spy in the Imperial Army, said the lieutenant and gestured towards a young, sandy-haired man who stepped forward and bowed to Vivek. What is your name and why is a Breton working for us against the Cyrodiils? asked Vivek, smiling. My name is Kessir Whitley, Whitley of Dwinen, said the man, and I am working for you because not everyone can say he is spied for a god, and I understood it would be, well, profitable. Vivek left, it will be if your information is accurate. 19th First Seed, 2920, Bodrum's Morrowind. The quiet hamlet of Bodrum looked down on the mean, meandering river, the Priai. It was an idyllic site, lightly wooded, where the water took the bend around a steep bluff to the east with a gorgeous wildflower meadow to the west. The strange flora of Morrowind met the strange flora of Cyrodiil on the border and commingled gloriously. It will be time to sleep when you're finished. When you finish, the soldiers had been hearing that all morning. It was not enough that they had been marching all night, now they were chopping down trees on the bluff and damming the river so its water spilled over. Most of them had reached the point where they were too tired to complain about being tired. Let me be certain I understand, my lord, said Vivix lieutenant. We take the bluff so we can fire our arrows and spell and spells down on them from above. That's why we need all the trees cleared out. Damming the river floods the plain below, so they'll be trudging through mud, which should hamper their movement. That's exactly half of it, said Vivek approvingly. He grabbed a nearby soldier who was hauling off the trees. Wait, I need you to break off the straightest, strongest branches of the trees and whittle them into spears. If you recruit a hundred or so others, it won't take you more than a few hours to make all we need. The soldier warily did as he was paid. The men and women got to work, fashioning spears from the trees. If you don't mind me asking, said the lieutenant, the soldiers don't need any more weapons. They're too tired to hold the ones they've got. The spears aren't for holding, said Vivek and whispered, if we tired them out today, they'll get a good night's sleep tonight before he got to work supervising their work. It was essential that they be sharp, of course, but equally important that they will be well balanced and tapered proportionally. The perfect point for stability was a pyramid, not the conical point or some lances and spears. Of some lances and spears. He had the men hurl the spears they had completed to test their strength, sharpness and balance, forcing them to begin on a new one if they broke. Gradually, out of sheer exhaustion from doing it wrong, the men learned how to create the perfect wooden spears. Once they were th through, he showed them how they were to be arranged and where. That night there was no drunken pre-battle carousing, and no nervous neophytes stayed up worrying about the battle to come. As soon as the sun sank beneath the wooded hills, the camp was at rest, but for the sentries. 20th first seed 29.20, Bodrum, Morrowind. Mm. Miramor was exhausted. For the last six days he had gambled and whored all night and then marched all day. He was looking forward to the battle, but even more than that, he was looking forward to some rest afterwards. He was in the Emperor's command at the rear flank, which was good because it seemed unlikely that he would be killed. On the other hand, it meant traveling over the mud and waste the army ahead left in their wake. 
As they began to the trek through the wildflower field, Miramor and all the soldiers around him sank ankle deep in cold mud. There was an effort to even keep moving. Far from far far up ahead, you could see the vanguard of the army led by Lord Storic emerging in the meadow at the base of a bluff. That was when it all happened. An army of Dunmer appeared above the above the bluff like rice in Tadra, pouring fire and floods of arrows down on the vanguard. Simultaneously, a company of men bearing the flag of the Duke of Mornhold galloped around the shore, disappearing along the shallow river's edge where it dipped to a timbered glen in the e to the east. Warchief Ulak, nearby on the right flank, let out a bellow of revenge at the sight and gave chase. Queen Nakea sent her flank towards the embankment to the west to intercept the army on the bluff. The Emperor could think of nothing to do. His troops were too bogged down to move forward quickly and join the battle. He ordered them to face east towards the timber in case Mornhold's company was trying to circle around through the woods. They never came out, but many men facing west missed the battle entirely. Miramor kept his eyes on the bluff. A tall Dunmer, he supposed, must have been Vivek gave a signal, and the battle mages cast their spells at something to the west. From what transpired, Miramor deduced it was a dam. A great torrent of water spilled out, washing Nakea's left flank to the remains of the vanguard, and the two together down the river to the east. The Emperor paused, as if waiting for his vanquished army to return, and then called the retreat. Miramor hid in the rushes until they had passed by, and then waited as quietly as he could to the bluff. The Morrowind army was retiring as well back to their camp. He could hear them celebrating above him as he padded along the shore. To the east he saw the Imperial army that had been washed into a net of spears strung across the river. Nagas left flank on Storic's vanguard of, on Ulag's right flank bodies of hundreds of soldiers strung together like beads. Miramor took whatever valuables he could carry from the corpses and then ran down the river. He had to go many miles before the water was clear again, unpolluted by blood. 29th First Seed, 2920, Hegathe Heimerfell. We have a letter from the Imperial City, said the chief priestess, handing the parchment to Korda. All the young priestesses smiled and f made faces of astonishment, but the truth was that Korda's sister, Rija, wrote very often, at least once a month. Korda took the letter to the garden to read it. Her favorite place, an oasis in the monochromatic, sand-colored world of the conver conservatorium, the letter itself was nothing unusual. Filled with court gossip, the latest fashions, which were tending to wind dark valleys and reports of the Emperor's ever-growing paranoia. You are so lucky to be away from all of this, wrote Regia. The Emperor is convinced that his latest battlefield fiasco is all as a result of spies in the palace. He has even taken to questioning me. Rubga keep it so you never have a life as interesting as mine. Korda listened to the sounds of the desert and prayed to Rubtuga. Rubtga to the exact opposite wish. The year is continued in the rain's hand. Rain's Hand, Book 4 of 2920, The Last Year of the First Year by Karl Vagtownway. Third Rain's Hand, 2920, Cold Harbor, Oblivion. So the seal proceeded as quickly as he could through the blackened halls of the palace, half submerged in black, brackish water. All around him, nasty gelatinous creatures scurried into the reeds, bursts of white fire lit up the upper arches of the hall before disappearing, and smells assaulted him, rinsed death one moment, sweet flowered perfume the next. Several times he had visited the Daedra princess in their oblivion, but every time something different awaited him. He knew his purpose and refused to be distracted. Eight of the more prominent Daedra princes were awaiting him in the half-melted domed room. Azura, Prince of Dusk and Dawn, Boethia, Prince of Plus, Hermamora, Daedra of Knowledge, Ersin, the Hunter, Malekith, God of Curses, Maru's Dagon, Prince of Disaster, Molag Bal, Prince of Rage, Shogoreth, the Mad One. Above them, the sky cast tormented shadows upon the meeting. Fifth Rain's Hand, 2920, the Isle of Arteum, Somerset. Sothasil's voice cried out, echoing from the cave, Move the rock. 
Immediately the initiates obeyed, rolling aside the great boulder that blocked the entrance to the dreaming cavern. Sothasil emerged, his face, his face smeared with ash, weary. He felt he had been away for months, years, but only a few days had transpired. Lilatha took his arm to help him walk, but he refused her help with a kind smile and a shake of his head. Were you successful? she asked. The Daedra Prince I spoke with I spoke with have agreed to our terms, he said flatly. Disasters such as befell Gilverdale should be averted. Only through certain intermediaries such as witches or sorcerers will they answer the call of men in myrrh. And what did you promise them in return? asked the Nord boy Welleg. The deals we make with Daedra, said Sothasil, continued on to Lachesis's palace to meet with the master of the Psychic Order, should not be discussed with the innocent. 8th Rain's, Rain's Hand, 2920, the Imperial City, Cyrodiil. A storm billeted the windows of the prince's bedchamber, bringing a smell of moist air to mix with censers filled with burning incense and herbs. A letter has arrived from the Empress, your mother. Your mother, said the courier, anxiously inquiring after your health. What frightened parents I have left Prince Juelek from his bed. It is only unnatural for a mother to worry, said Severian Chorak, the potentate's son. There is everything unnatural about my family, Akavir. My exiled mother fears that my father will imagine me of being a traitor, covetous of the crown, and is having me poisoned. The prince sank back into his pillow annoyed. The emperor has insisted on me having a taster for all my meals as he does. There are many plots, agreed the Akivir. You have been aimed for nearly three weeks with every healer in the empire shuffling through like a slow ballroom dance. At least all I can see that you're getting stronger. Strong enough to lead the vanguard against Morrowind soon, I hope, said Juelek. 11 the Rain's Hand, 2920, the Isle of Artem, Somerset. The initiates stood quietly in a row along the Arbor Logia, watching the long, deep marble lined trench ahead of, the, of them flash with fire. The air above it vibrated with the waves of heat. Though each student kept his or her face sturdy and motionless, as the troop Sijiku issued, their terror was nearly as palpable as the heat. So the seal closed his eyes and uttered the charm of fire resistance. Slowly he walked across the basin of leaping flames, climbing to the other side, unscathed. Not even his white robe had been burned. The charm is intensified by the energy you bring to it, by your own skills just as all spells are, he said. Your imagination and your willpower are the keys. There is no need for a spell to give you a resistance to air or a resistance to flowers, and after you cast the charm, you must forget there is even need for a spell to give you resistance to fire. Do not confuse what I am saying. Resistance is not about ignoring the fires to reality. You will feel the substance of flame, the texture of it, its hunger, and even the heat of it, but you will know that it will not hurt or injure you. The students nodded and one by one they cast the spell and make the walk through the fire. Some even went so far as to bend over and scoop up a handful of fire and feed it air, so it expanded like a bubble and melted through their fingers. So the seal smiled. They were fighting their fear admirably. The chief proctor, Thargalith, came running from the arbor arches. So the seal, Almalexia has arrived on our team. Yachesis told me to fetch you. So the seal turned to Thargalith for only a moment, but he knew instantly from the screams what had transpired. The Nord Lad Welleck had not cast the spell properly and was burning. The smell of scorched hair and flesh panicked the other students who were struggling to get out of the basin, pulling him with them, but the incline was too steep away from the entry points. With a wave of his hand, Sothasil extinguished the flame. Welleck and several other students were burned, but not badly. The sorcerer cast a healing spell on them before turning back to Thargalith. I'll be with you in a moment and give Almalexia the time to shake the road dust from the, her train. So the seal turned back to the students, his voice flat. Fear does not break spells, but doubt and incompetence are the great enemies of any spellcaster. Master Welleg, you will pack your bags. I'll arrange for a boat to bring you to the mainland tomorrow morning. 
The sorcerer found Almalexia and Yachas in the study, drinking hot tea and laughing. She was more beautiful than he had remembered, though he had never before seen her so disheveled. Wrapped in a blanket, dangling her damp long black tresses before the fire to dry, at Sothasil's approach she leapt, leapt to her feet and embraced him. Did you swim all the way from Morrowind? He smiled. It's pouring rain from sky washed down to the coast, she explained, returning his smile. Only half league away and it never rains here, said the HS is proudly. Of course, I sometimes miss the excitement of Somerset and sometimes even the mainland itself. Still, I'm always very impressed by anyone out there who gets anything accomplished. It's a world of distractions. Speaking of distractions, what's all this I hear about a war? You mean the one that's been blooding the continent for the last 80 years, master? asked Sothasil, amused. I suppose that's the one I mean, said the Yachesis with a shrug of his shoulders. How is that war going? We'll lose it unless I can convince Sothasil to leave Arteum, said Almalexia, losing her smile. She had meant to wait and talk to her friend in private, but she, the old Altmer gave, the courage, gave her courage to press on. I've had I have had visions, I know it to be true. So the seal was silent for a moment and then looked at Yashesis. I must return to Morrowind. Knowing you, if you must do something, you will, sighed the old master. The Psygic's way is not to be distracted. Wars are fought, empires rise and fall, you must go, and so must we. What do you mean, Yashesis, you're leaving the island? No, the island will be leaving the sea said the Ashesis, his voice taken on a dreamy quality. In a few years the mist will move over our team and we will be gone. We are counselors by nature, and there are too many counselors in Tem Temriel as it is. No, we'll go and return when the land needs us again, perhaps in another age. The old Altmer struggles to his feet and drains the past sip of his drink before leaving Sothasil and Almalexia alone, not miss the last boat. The year continues in the second seed. Second seed, Book 5 of 2920, the last year of the first year, by Karl Vagtanway. Tenth second seed, 2920, the Imperial City, Cyril. Your Imperial Majesty, said the potentate Versa Duché, opening the door to his chamber with a smile. I have not seen you lately. I thought perhaps you were indisposed with the lovely Risha. She's taking the baths at Mir Korob. The Emperor Raymond III said miserably, Please come in. I've reached the stage where I can only trust three people. You, my son the prince, and Risha, said the Emperor petulantly. My entire council is nothing but a pack of spies. What seems to be the matter, your Imperial Ma Majesty? asked the potentate versus the shame sympathetically, drawing close to the thick curtain in his chamber. Instantly all sound outside the room was extinguished, echoing footsteps in the marble halls and burst in the springtide gardens. I discovered that a notorious poisoner, an Orma tribeswoman from Black Marsh called Kachika, was with the army at Kersuvio while we were encamped there when my son was poisoned before the battle of Bo at Bodron. I'm sure she would have preferred to kill me, but the opportunity didn't present itself, the Emperor fumed. The Council suggests that we need evidence of her involvement before we prosecute. Of course they would, said the potentate thoughtfully, particularly if one or more of them was in the is on was in on the plot. I have a thought, your Imperial Majesty. Yes, said Rimon impatiently, out with it. Tell the Council you're dropping the matter, and I will send out the guard to track this Kachika down and follow her. We'll see who her friends are, and perhaps get an idea of the scope of this plot on your Imperial Majesty's life. Yes, yeah, said Raymond with a satisfied frown, that's a capital plan. We'll track this scheme to whomever, whomever it leads to. Decidedly, your Imperial Majesty, smiled the potentate, parting the curtain so the Emperor could leave. In the hallway outside was Versity Shea's son, Saverian Chorak. The boy bowed to the Emperor before entering the potentate's chamber. Are you in trouble, father? whispered the Akavir lad. I heard the Emperor found out about what's her name, the poisoner. 
The great art of speechcraft, my boy, said Versidacia to his son, is to tell them what they want to hear in a way that gets them to do what you want them to do. I need you to get a letter to Kachika and make certain that she understands that if she does not follow the instructions perfectly, she is risking her own life more than ours. 13th, 2nd C, 29-20, Mir Korab, Cyrodiil. Risha sank luxuriantly into the burbling hot spring, feeling her skin tingle like it was being rubbed by a million of little stones. The rock shelf over her head sheltered her from the misting, misting rain, but let all the sunshine in, streaming in layers through the branches of the trees. It was an idyllic moment in an idyllic life, and when she was finished, the, she knew that her beauty would be entirely restored. The only thing she needed was a drink of water. The bath, the bath itself, while wonderfully fragrant, tasted always of chalk. Water, she cried to her servants, water please. A gaunt woman, with rags tight over her eyes, ran to her side and dropped a gold skin of water. Richa was about to laugh at the woman's prudery, she herself was not ashamed of her naked body, but then she noticed through a crease in the rags that the old woman had no eyes at all. She was like one of these Orma tribesmen Rija had heard about, but never met. Born without eyes, they were masters of their own senses. The lord of Mir Korob hired every very exotic servants, she thought to herself. In a moment, the woman was gone and forgotten. Rija found it very hard to concentrate on anything but the sun and the water. She opened the cork, but the liquid within had a strange metallic smell to it. Suddenly she was aware that she was not alone. Lady Rija, said the captain of the Imperial Guard, you are, as I see, acquainted with Kachika. I've never heard of her, stammered Rija before becoming indignant. What are you doing here? This body is not for your leering eyes. Never heard of her when we saw her with you not a minute ago, said the captain, picking up the cold skin and smelling it. Brought your Nivea sea cord, did she, to poison the emperor with? Captain, said one of the guards running up to him quickly. We cannot find Arg the Argonian, it is as if she disappeared into the woods. Yes, they're good at that, said the captain. No matter though, we've got her contact at court. That should please his imperial majesty, seize her. As the guards pulled the really naked woman from the pool, she screamed, I'm innocent, I don't know what this is all about, but I've done nothing. The emperor will have your heads for this. Yes, I imagine he will, smiled the captain, if he trusts you. 21st second C, 2920, Gideon, Black Marsh. The saw and vulture tavern was the sort of out-of-the-way place that Zook favored, for these sorts of interviews. Besides himself and his companion, there were only a couple of old sea dogs in the shadowy room and they were more unconscious from drink than aware. The grime of the unwashed floor was something you felt rather than saw. Copious dust hung in the air and moving in the sparse trace of dying sunlight. You have experience in heavy combat? asked Zook. The reward is good for this assignment, but the risks are great as well. Certainly I have combat experience, Reply, replied Miramor hotly. I was at the Battle of Bodrum just two months ago. If you do your part and get the Emperor to ride through those Sapas with the minimal escorts of the day and the time we've discussed, I'll do my part. Just be certain that he's not traveling in disguise. I'm not going to slaughter every caravan that passes through in the hopes that it contains Emperor Riemann. Zook smiled and Miramor looked at himself in the Gothringi's reflective face. He liked the way he looked, the consummate, the consummate confident professional. Agreed, said Zook, and then you shall have the rest of your gold. Zook placed the large chest onto the table between them. He stood up. Wait a few minutes before leaving, said Zook. I don't want you following me. Your employers wish to maintain their anonymity if by chance you are caught and tortured. Fine by me said Miramor, ordering more grog. Zook rode his mount through the cramped labyrinthine streets of Gideon, and both he and his horse were happy to pass through the gates into the country. The main road to Castle Geoves was flooded as it was every year in springtide, but Zook knew a shorter way over the hills. Riding fast under trees drooping with moss and treacherous slime-coated rocks, he arrived at the castle gates in two hours' time. 
He wasted no time in climbing to Tavia's cell at the top of the highest tower. What do you think of him? asked the Empress. He's a fool, replied Zook, but that's what we want for this sort of assignment. 30th, 2nd C, 2920, Thusa Fortress, Cyrodiil. Risha screamed and screamed and screamed. Within her cell, her only audience was the giant grey stones, crusted with moss but still sturdy. The guards outside were deaf to her as they were deaf to all prisoners. The Emperor, miles away in the Imperial City, had likewise been deaf to her cries of innocence. She screamed knowing well that no one would likely hear her again. Her ever again. 31st Second Seed, 2920, Kavos Rim Pass, Cyrodiil. It had been days, weeks since Turala had seen another human face, Cyrodiil or Dunmer. As she trod the road, she thought to herself how strange it was that such an uninhabited place as Cyrodiil had become the imperial province, seat of an empire. Even the Bosmer in Valenwood must have more populated forests than this heartland would. She thought back, was it a month ago, too, when she crossed the border from Morrowind to Cyrodiil? It had been much colder then, but other than that she had no sense of time. The guards had been brusque, but as she was carrying no weaponry, they elected to let her through. Since then she had seen a few caravans, even shared a meal with some adventurers camping for the night, but met no one who would give her a ride to a town. Turala stripped off her shawl and dragged it behind her. For a moment she thought she heard someone behind her and spun around. No one was there. Just a bird perched on a branch, making a sound like laughter. She walked on and then stopped. Something was happening. The child had been kicking in her belly for some time now, but this was a different kind of spasm. With a groan, she lurched over to the side of the path, collapsed into the grass. Her child was coming. She lay on her back and pushed, but she could barely see with her tears of pain and frustration. How had it come to this? Given birth in the wilderness, all by herself to a child whose father was the Duke of Mournhold, her scream of rage and agony shook the birds from the trees. The bird that had been laughing at her earlier flew down on the road to the road. She blinked, and the bird was gone. And in its place, a naked elf man stood, not as dark as the Dunmer, but not as pale as the Altmer. She knew it at once. It was an alien, a wild elf. Torala screamed, but the man held her down. After a few minutes of struggle, she felt a release and then faded away. When she awoke, it was to the sound of a baby crying. The child had been cleaned and was lying by her side. Turala picked up her baby girl and, for the first time that year, felt tears of happiness stream down her face. She whispered to the trees, Thank you, and began walking with babe in her arms down the road to the west. The year is continued in mid-year. All right. These are long books. But at least there is progress. So I thank you everyone for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. I wish you good nights with dreams. And stay tuned for the next episode of the Elder Scrolls Fire Skyrim lore reading. Long life to you. I hope that ne the next stream will be a bit longer. So I could read all of the books. And... Mm, finally, we could complete uh, Skyrim's lore, and well, it's a bit sad that we'll be uh, completing the game totally. So, stay tuned for the next episode and see you around. Bye. I am your Lord and your shield. Oh, and we also will be ready enough. To another streamer. Alright, who we have? Okay, so there is Mary playing the Cult of the Lamb. Alright, let's raid her. Before I started my stream, I was um, watching her streaming, so let's go to her. So, yet again, I thank you all for watching. See you around. Bye!